Hi guys. Have I worn this shirt before? I probably have. I don't know if you guys have noticed it. Um. Anyway. So you'll probably be wondering how the heck those two stories that I told you yesterday connect to the today. Stupid mirroring. Anyway, so I had a rehearsal for a play that I'm in that I'm performing in a couple of weeks up in up for a conference. And it's called The Weir and sorry. And so I'm not performing this part for obvious reasons, but um that you guys might want to hear this monologue. No, you see, something happened to me. That just hearing you talk about it tonight, it's important to me that I'm not bananas. I mean, I'm fairly straight. Down the line. Person. Working. I had a good job at DCU. I had gone back to work after having my daughter Neve. My husband teaches engineering at DCU. We had Neve in 1988, and I went to went back to work when she was five. When she started school, and we'd leave her with Daniel's parents, my husband's parents. Her mother always picked her up from school, and I'd collect her after work. And last year, she was dying to learn to swim. And the school had a thing. They'd take a class down to the CRC in Klontarf on Wednesdays. She was learning very well, no problem. She loved the water. She couldn't wait for Wednesdays in swimming. Daniel used to take her to the pool on Saturdays and everything. But for such a bright, outgoing, happy girl, she was a big, uh, she had a problem sleeping at night. She was afraid of the dark. She never wanted you to leave the room. One of us would have to lie there with her until she went off. And even when she did, she'd often have to come in and sleep with us. And I'd say to her, what's wrong when you go to bed? But in the daytime, you know, she wouldn't care. Nighttime was a billion, was a million miles away, and she wouldn't think about it. But at night, there were people at the window. There were people in the attic. There was someone coming up the stairs. There were all, there were children knocking in the wall. <laughs> Eh. And there was always a man standing across the road who'd she see. Like there were loads of things. The poor... I wanted to bring her to the doctor, but the Daniel said she'd grow out of it, and, should, and we should be careful. Just about books we got her, and what we saw on the telly, and things like that. But I mean, she used to even be scared that when she got up in the morning, that Mammy and Daddy would have gone, and she'd be in the house all on her own. That was the one she told Daniel's mother. And all the furniture and the carpets and everything would be gone. I mean, you know, so I told her after that, you know, we'd never, you know, it was ridiculous. And that if she was worried at all during the day to ring me and I'd come and get her. And there was nothing to worry about. And she knew our number. She was very good at re learning numbers off and everything. She knew ours and her Nana's and mine at work. She knew them all, but then, in March last year, the school had a, a sponsored swim, and I promised I was going to watch her, but I got, I was late, out of work, and I was only going to be there in time to meet her afterwards, but, um, when I got there, there was an ambulance, and I thought, this pool is the central remedial clinic, so I thought it was just someone being dropped there, and I didn't really pay attention. When I got in, I saw that there was no one in the pool, and one of the teachers was there with a group of kids, and she was crying, and some of them were crying also. And this woman, another of the moms had come over and said there'd been an accident, and Neve had hit her head in the pool, and she'd been in the water, and they'd been trying to resuscitate her, but she said she was going to be all right, and I didn't believe it was happening. I thought it must have been someone else, and I went into... I was brought into a room, and Neve was on a table. 
It was a table for table tennis, and the ambulance man was giving her the kiss of life. She was in her bathing suit, and the ambulance man said he didn't know what was working, and he didn't know if she was alive. And he wrapped her in a towel, and carried her out in, out of the out to the ambulance. And they got in the back with him, and they radioed on ahead. They were going to put her on a machine in Beaumont and try to revive her there. But the ambulance man knew, I think. She wasn't breathing, and he just knew. And he said, if I wanted to say goodbye to her in the ambulance, in case I didn't get a chance at the hospital. And I gave her a little hug. She was freezing cold. And I told her Mammy loved her very much. And she just looked asleep. But her lips were gone blue, and she was dead. And it happened so fast. Just a few minutes, and I don't think I have to tell you how hard it was. Between me and Daniel, as well, it didn't seem real. At the funeral, I thought I could go and lift her out of the coffin, and that would be the end of all this. I think Daniel was. I don't know if he actually blamed me, but there was nothing I could do. But he became very busy in work, just keeping himself. Um, but I was, you know, I was more, I just didn't really know what I was doing. Just walking around, wanting to, sitting on the house with Daniel's mother, fussing about the place. Just months of this, not really talking about it, like. But, and then one morning I was in bed. Daniel had gone to work. And I was, I usually lay there for a few hours trying to stay asleep, really, I suppose. And the phone rang, and I just left it. I wasn't going to get it, and it rang for a long time. Um, it eventually stopped, and I was dropping off again. But then it started ringing again. So I thought it must have been Daniel trying to get to me. Someone who knew I was there. So I went down and answered it. And the line was very faint. It was like a cross line. There were voices, but I couldn't hear what they were saying. And then I heard Neve, and she said, Mammy? And I just said, you know, yes. And she said, she wanted me to come get her. I mean, I wasn't sure whether this was a dream or her leaving us had been a dream. And I just said, where are you? And she said she thought she was at Nana's in the bedroom. But Nana wasn't there, and she was scared. There were children knocking in the walls, and the man was standing across the road, and he was looking up, and he was going to cross the road, and would I come get her? And I said I would, of course I would. And I dropped the phone, and I ran out of the car in just the t-shirt I slept in, and I drove to Daniel's mother house, and I could hardly see. I was just trying so much, you know. I mean, I knew she wasn't going to be there. I knew she was gone. But to think that wherever she was, that and there was nothing I could do about it. Daniel's mother got a, a doctor, and I slept for a day or two. But it was, Daniel felt that I needed to face up to me being gone. But I just thought that he should face up to what happened to me. He was insisting that I get some treatment, and then everything would be okay. But, you know, I can help that if she's out there, if she still needs me.